Forecast News is your gateway to all things blockchain. We do the deep dive and the due diligence on the blockchain projects and platforms that matter because we aim to be the most reliable source of intellectual discourse and insight that inform, educate, and bridge the gap between the blockchain industry and the mainstream. So the revolutionary comes from open source, but increasingly we're seeing from the corporate world, including JP Morgan, really applying blockchain technology internally within their own systems and right. it's privatized. Is that a good direction for the industry? I think overall software is moving the open source direction. I, the last grand holdout was Microsoft. Uh, they had a CEO who said open source cancer, uh, software is cancer. That was Steve Ballmer and my, Bill Gates. They both thought that. Now they have Satya Nadella and you know they're using Linux. They've open source.net. Uh, so the fact that a company that could be that hostile to that ethos is now moving so far in the other direction that they're they're taking some of their core infrastructure and giving it to Apple and, and Azure everybody else. is actually um, working a lot with the uh, open with source blockchain. software, yeah, right. and, and they have a blockchain as a service project. So uh, so as a consequence, I think overall the trend is moving towards open source. Now that said, there's certainly plenty of people in our space who are patenting things. Uh, Hashgraph is patenting things. Uh, Algorand is. Uh, DML probably, uh, Digital Asset Holdings, excuse me, probably has some patents in their portfolio. And uh, a lot of cases they do this to, to get acquired uh, or to, to work with larger companies because then they can do a license deal. But in our view, that violates the fundamental ethos of decentralization and being useful to everybody. So we as a company don't pursue patents, don't pursue intellectual property. All software we write is under an MIT license. And uh, there are many other people in the space who also follow that ethos. In fact, the majority of the people are open source. And uh, at the end of the day, when we talk with governments and universities, usually this is a prerequisite for adopting a system. They don't want to get locked into a particular standard and then be forced forever to license from one particular company. They'd much rather have an open source foundation and know that if regimes change, facts and circumstances change, they have the freedom to uh, fork and go in a different direction without my consent or some other person's consent. The regimes not only include industries, but it call also includes nation states. It mm -hmm. also includes uh, complete economic ecosystems in which we currently exist. Do you feel that if we do get to a point of mass adoption in which you're working towards, that that's going to be upended, that the, the society and the fabric and, and the economy that exists today is really going to shift dramatically because of blockchain? I think the internet is what's changing society. I mean, we think of it as an old technology, but we're, we're just now running experiments. You know, if you look at human society, it's, it's many, many thousands of years, right? Mm -hmm. And the internet's only been around for a little bit. This concept of having instantaneous access to information, it fundamentally changes the structure of society. We used to build cities around libraries and yeah. palaces because that's where all the knowledge was and all the smart people were. And rivers for transportation. E exactly, yeah. right? Uh, so all of a sudden now we have a situation where somebody in the Namibian desert can be as just as well informed as someone you know, in Cambridge, Massachusetts at Harvard. It's never been a time in human history you've had that. Well, what is the social consequence of this? People have an overwhelming amount of information and now they see counter narratives to what the governments are saying, religions are saying, the media is saying. Uh, and in some cases you have the fake news phenomena or conspiracy theories or siloing. In other cases you have people say, wait a minute, these systems we've inherited from our fathers and our grandfathers and their fathers maybe aren't well suited for society today. Back in the 19th and 20th century, there was a very famous picture uh, right when uh, uh, one of the monarchs in England died. Uh, all these kings of Europe showed up for his funeral because he was related to most of the, uh, the, the European royal families. And within just 10 years of that picture being taken, almost all those kings had been deposed or depowered as a mm. consequence of World War I. So you have the social system of kings ruling Europe for a very long time, and then suddenly an inflection point is reached and almost all of them are removed and new governments are put in. And I think the internet is causing this globally speaking. It's making us think less about our particular country and it's thinking more about the world. It's making us think more about collective global problems like global warming or uh, you know, systemic poverty or equal treatment of people. Uh, and things that are happening in the Nuba Mountains or for Saudi wives suddenly mm -hmm. are problems in New York or in suddenly are problems in London. And that's the first time in human history. Knowledge, so. though, is one thing. Access to a greater world and understanding it is one thing. Being able to participate in it and do something about it is completely different. And that's where really blockchain changes the equation for right. a lot of people. Right, because it gives you an economic voice. That's you know, right. I was in Mongolia and I was in the outskirts of Mongolia and I saw this camel herder come by and we talked to him. and. He, uh, he has Bitcoin. It just blew my mind. When I first entered the space, I signed up for a meetup group, uh, and there was two people who registered, myself and another person. The other person didn't show up, so I had a great conversation with myself about my love of Bitcoin. 
And then just uh, eight years later, you know, I'm in Mongolia and a camel herder has Bitcoin. So it really tells you that things change pretty quickly. And what does it mean? It means he has an economic voice. That person can now, for the first time ever, buy things and participate in a global economy. And, uh, and when that gets extended to voting, it gets extended to property rights, it gets extended to securitization of financial markets, uh, that means that everybody in the world is now on the same playing field. And he, the smallest person has the same access that Bill Gates has. He's so what happens to central banks? What happens to banks? They, they have to, instead of being middlemen of necessity, they have to become middlemen of value. Mm. There's all these entities in, in society that provide some service, and we don't really like them, but they're there and we need them to get something done. It's like the Ebays and the Airbnbs and the Ubers. You know, they're there, they provide a lot of utility, they bring two sides of a market together, a producer and a, and a consumer. But then what happens is they get a monopoly, and then as a consequence of that, they start to platforming people or screwing people on fees, and they really sculpt the market in a way that, that becomes very unfair. So what our technology is doing is it's getting rid of these middlemen of necessity. It's mm -hmm. allowing the producer and consumer now to find each other and, and interact with each other as if Uber existed or Airbnb existed or these other middlemen existed. But instead of having that middleman taking value away from them, uh, they, we no longer need them. It's almost an interesting analogy to blockchain platforms itself. That is there a winning platform or can many platforms coexist because they serve different functions in the same way is there a winning economic system or can there be multiple economic systems that work in concert and with each other? There's never been a time in human history where we've ever universally agreed on everything. You know, we've never had one God and one language and uh, one government. Uh, people are diverse because facts and circumstances and resources and situations are diverse. Weather is diverse. Uh, I live in Colorado. They're going through a polar vortex right now. Mm -hmm. and it's pretty brutal and it's nice and warm out here. Uh, so, uh, so given that the world is a very diverse place, uh, reflections of that diversity will manifest themselves in political and economic systems. So we're going to have many blockchains, many different ways of handling money, some more decentralized, some more, decent, uh, some more centralized. The point is that consumer choice and the freedom of movement is increasing. Instead of being locked into a system and forced to live in that system and endure the consequences of that system, uh, like if you're in Venezuela, you just have to accept the world around you, you now have a way of insulating yourself a bit or voting with your, with your digital feet and moving into a different mm. system. So not too distant future, instead of having just one currency and saying, if I live in America, I'm dollars, I live in Europe, I'm euros, you could now actually have portfolio-based wealth, you know, some gold, some silver, some stocks, some different currencies, and you can spend any one of them at any point of sale. So when you go to Starbucks, you'll be able to just tap your phone. You paid them in gold, they got paid in dollars. They have no idea you even paid in gold because mm -hmm. that infrastructure is all there. And nobody even knows that composition. And you could be from Ukraine, you could be from South Korea. It doesn't really matter. So what does it mean? It means that the impact that central banks have upon your lifestyle and your quality of life diminishes. And if they're going to be relevant, then they actually have to become minimum of value. They mm -hmm. add something to your life. They add something to the transaction. They add something to the economy. And if not, they become obsolete, like the horse and buggy makers and the horse whip makers and the others that uh, got uh, you know, kind of pushed up by the cars. Uh, and society moves on and changes.